Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Nice to see you all. I'm not only part of the University of East Anglia, but uh, Suffolk University here is part of the academic complex that University of East Anglia sponsors and supports, so we're in it together. It's rather nice. Um, my job this morning is to pick up some of the themes from the earlier speakers and raise some slightly more interesting issues about how we manage water in our landscapes for the next 20 to 30 years, which is a framework that you'll hear from Peter Simpson, who is the chief exec of uh, Angley Water, when he speaks after lunch. Uh, and then I want to start by congratulating the team for using the word landscapes for life. Because in the days when I started all this stuff, we had two concepts from what was the ancient conservancy in the old days, and then the Countryside Commission in the old days. One was natural areas, and the other one was country character landscapes, or country character maps. And we've forgotten how important larger areas of integrated bits of land should fit together. And we've been driven by something more narrow called the catchment, and less actually realistic than the landscape. And Landscape for Living raises some very interesting points which we heard from the tourist side this morning and also from Howard. It's actually about people living and learning to work together and sharing not only a resource but a way of living. And, and the point I'm going to make this morning is we need to go into a new form of social sharing of the way we use our water and our land. Otherwise we're not going to enjoy this concept of Landscape for Life. And why is this important? Because the main reason is that water has become rather a, a what might be called a contrary customer. But be careful of your language. There's a very famous American philosopher who said, wrote a very interesting essay called The Rights of Nature. And he said the most important right of nature is to prove that we're always going to be wrong. Human beings never can understand nature completely. So the greatest right of nature is to force us to be humble. So when we have a picture like you showed Howard of the Shrewsbury area covered in water, it's not that water in that case is a nuisance, it's that we're the nuisance in not looking at water in a different way. And when water is scarce, as we have in many parts of the south and eastern part of England, it's not that water suddenly becomes a nuisance because it's not there, it's because we're using it in a poor way. So the fact that water is what I call Goldilocks, it's neither the right amount, it's either too much or too little, is actually because we are the people not in the right place. That's what we've got to learn from a conference like this. What does this mean for a conference like this? I'm going to make three points and I'm going to challenge you all to look at it. The first thing is we need a new social framework for recognizing that water, when it lands on this planet, whether it's on a roof, or on a garden, or in a road area, or on the open landscape that we saw in Wales, it becomes something to be managed in a creative way. Every drop of water landing on the landscape, whatever it lands, can now be managed and designed in a creative way, if we get the right incentives and the right planning. Right now, the planning system is not geared very satisfactorily for handling water in excess or in drought. And I'm working with a team of people to redefine the planning guidelines so that we have much more porosity, we have much more caching of water, and that all new houses should be actually reservoirs in their own right, and not simply places from which water flows and causes the kind of damage that we saw in the picture earlier on. That means, therefore, we need a new kind of moral order between the public, the regulatory bodies, and Charlie will say something about this, I think, in a few minutes, and the water companies. Now, I'm going to argue for what we might call a social interest role for the modern water company. And Peter Simpson, who's coming this afternoon, knows what I'm going to say. I've discussed this with him. And I think he's on the same line, so you could get a chance to do something about it. What do we mean by a social interest company? It means a company is not perceived by the consumer as just a private sector, stakeholder-driven or shareholder-driven, director-orientated body. It is a company that genuinely aligns itself to the land and to people, and to creating wealth through both recreation and economic enterprise, and also the health of the communities around. 
That means in turn that the water company should think about the whole idea of capturing water and giving people incentives for not wasting it and for reducing their long-term investment costs by not having to have new reservoirs, lots of piping, lots of pumping and taking water from the trench or even further afield to feed the voracious appetite of growing East Anglia. If we were to shave a quarter of everyone's domestic consumption and a third of everyone's commercial consumption within the next 10 years and incentivize people to do that, it would be a completely different world. If people could see that by sharing the water and reducing their demand per head, it would make a big difference to the way the water company was seen. So I'm arguing for the equivalent of a water feed-in tariff. That when you reduce your water, you get paid for doing it because you're reducing the burden of future company investment costs on water transfer and water availability. I'm also arguing for what's called distributed water. In other words, water made much more locally in terms of water supply and water management rather than the big piping systems, which are not only expensive, but in case you don't know, carry large amounts of energy and with that energy come. And it's worth bearing in mind that every litre of water we consume in East Anglia carries with it 0.7 of a gram of carbon in its uh, movement. And if we're going to be carbon reducing in our households, cutting water is one of the ways to go about it, changing our food habits is another, more important than changing our energy and our transport use, which is what people mostly think about in this area. But actually more important than that, and this is the bit I'm really driving at, is the whole idea of a new form of landscape covenant whereby we actually pools of income coming from this kind of shared resource. And for that to happen, three things are needed. One is we need much more sophisticated use of computer technology and online servicing so that people can actually see how much water they're using on a daily basis. And when they stop doing something, change their showering habits, change their gardening habits, change their toilet use, and so on, it can all be done so they can see a result. And right now we hide our water meters in some obscure part of the household and no one knows what on earth is going on uh, when they are saving water. We need this much more up to date. We need phone applications which allow people to see exactly what they're using in water at any moment of the day. And in the modern age there's nothing to stop that. Peter, interesting enough, is going to talk about a plan for 2030, which is 27 years from now. If we go back 27 years, it would be 1987, when there was nothing called online. So we're only talking about a phase which is remarkable in how it's moved in the last 20 or so, seven years, but could be used so much more creatively in the next 27. If people could do that kind of thing, then they would start utilizing their water differently. Then we need to mobilize the schools, as indeed we're doing in North, not part of this program. Create what are called eco-incubation, young people who are looking at water and looking at energy, looking at carbon, looking at waste and looking at food in a completely different way, as resources to be managed for health, for the environment, for the next generation and for others, and not resources which are simply consumed because they happen to be on tap. And it's very important that Anglian water is moved from having a tap with a drop coming from it, which was their image of water, to a local cold water love of the drop. Because basically what the schools are doing are saying to the communities, every single drop you save is for somebody else. It's for nature, it's for another generation, it's for people who don't necessarily have the water that they need right now, the farming communities and elsewhere. What we need is that link, that moral, and financial link between water saving and water care and bettering other people in the same landscape. So the landscape becomes a metaphor for sharing and for collective endeavor over a much longer period. So my third and final point is that I would like to see a transformation in the way we define the private enterprise so it becomes a social interest operation, not just in water, but also in energy and also in waste and also associated with food. These are areas that we will move toward, in my view, in the 30 years of Peter's prescription for Anglian water over the next uh, 2030. And then we can talk about not only a sustainable household, but a sustainable community, so that people actually work with each other. If you want to know anything about social behavior, uh, 
two things which really make people tick are one, they share a common interest. Two, they actually do what the neighbor is doing and understand what the neighbor is doing and what they should be doing. And three, most importantly, they take pride in the outcome. And we've lost that concept of pride. And pride in the landscape and pride in the community is a line that I would strongly recommend you take on board at this conference. So I leave you with the thought that every year there should be a water day, a landscape for life water day, in every right across East Anglia, where schools and communities talk about work toward creating new forms of charities that actually are gearing the saving of water and the reduction in the overall cost of water into recreating new forms of water economy. The kind that we heard from Howard earlier on and from uh, the speaker from the uh, from the visit England. Those are the ways we're going to generate the next creation of water from locally saved water and locally redistributed water rather than from a very costly new form of water regime. And in that, the water company is not only social interest, but it's also part of a collectivity of souls, which is landscapes for life. Thank you very much.